Friends, I bid you welcome. Wherever you are watching this, uh, this video, it's wonderful that you've joined us. Thank you for joining us for our new series, which I've called Give Us a King, studies in the book of 1 Samuel, the Bible book of 1 Samuel. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to get stuck into our studies together. Come, let's pray. Father, you're a God who works salvation. There is none like you. No one that we can count on like you. You know, and you see, and you weigh. You break the bowels of the mighty, and you bind up the feeble. You empty the full and feed the empty. You make the barren fruitful, and the mother of many forlorn. You kill, and you bring to life. You make poor, and you make rich. You bring low, and you exult. You raise up the needy to fill them with good things. You will guard the faithful and destroy the wicked. Might shall not prevail. You will judge the earth and exalt your King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, we pray, as we study for Jesus' sake. Amen. King Mufasa and Queen Sarabi have a son who they name Simba. He is the heir to the throne, but Simba has an enemy, his uncle, the wicked Scar. Scar covets Simba's throne, and so he plots to eliminate Mufasa and Simba in order that he might be crowned king. As Disney's famous story, The Lion King, unfolds, Scar takes action to bring about the desire of his heart to be king. He sets a trap for Cinder, Simba. He, he lures the foolish and naive young cub into a gorge and, and gets the hyenas to drive a herd of wildebeest into a stampede that will trample Simba to death. And he then runs to Mufasa, warning him of his son's imminent peril, knowing that the Lion King will rush to save his heir. Mufasa manages to save Simba, but ends up hanging perilously from the air, from the gorge's edge. Scar refuses to help and sends Mufasa falling to his death. He, he then convinces Simba, Simba that the tragedy was the, was the cub's fault. Scar tells him he must leave the kingdom and never return. And then, just to make sure, he orders the hyenas to kill the cub to make sure that he never returns. Somehow, Simba manages to escape, running into the desert where he collapses. As the vultures descend and, and, and start to feed on the exhausted cub, he's, he's rescued by the outcasts Timon and Pumba, the lovable rogue meerkat and the warthog. Now that story is called a midpoint reversal. It shakes everything up and it changes the direction of the story. Not every story has one. Many stories are tragedies. They have no reversal in them at all. Bad news just simply becomes worse news. These stories end in heartbreak. And many human lives are filled with heartbreak. But happy ending stories, stories which writers call comedies, have somewhere in them a midpoint reversal. Somewhere in the story, things start to change. Things that were going badly now start to improve. Somewhere in the middle of the story, a reversal happens, which changes things. It changes the trajectory of the story, and it brings about what our hearts desire, a happy ending. They find a vaccine for coronavirus. That would be a midpoint reversal. Well, let me ask you about your life. Is it a tragedy? Or does it have a happy ending? Many think that the human story is a tragedy. If you're an atheist or a nihilist, or you hold a postmodern incredulity towards meta-narratives, then you don't believe that there is necessarily a big story with a happy ending to it. Life is 
Well, it's simply life. It's got no meaningful beginning and no meaningful ending that we can foresee or predict. It might end happily, but we can't be sure. Nor, nor can we have any confidence that it will all unfold happily. Life is simply a tale. Perhaps in those famous words, a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. But the Bible presents a, a, a different tale. It presents a story with a midpoint reversal in it. Things have been going in one direction. When God reverses them and changes the direction of the story once and for all. So that the ending is fundamentally different. Fundamentally altered and changed. Now, today we begin our new series in the Bible book called One Samuel. It's a book, obviously, about Samuel, hence its name, and it's a, it's a book also about Saul, and it's a book about David. But none of those three, important as they are, are the major players. Because First Samuel is actually a book where we meet the God of reversals. This book is not going to show us God's great reversal, for that we'll have to read on into other bits of the Bible, but this book is going to get us ready so that when that reversal happens, we see it, and we know it, and we don't miss it, and we appropriate it for ourselves. Because if God is the God of reversals, well then our whole world is different. The trajectory of life is different, and we can live knowing that there actually is a happy ending to this story that we call life. Well, it was a time of chaos. It was a horrible time to be alive. Israel was at war with itself. Judges chapter 20 tells us that uh, civil wars are the worst of wars, but Israel was at, was at war with its neighbours. In Judges 17, the erratic and neurotic and self-absorbed judge Samson was, was either ruling or recently dead, and, and he left behind him a trail of chaos wherever he went. And, and then there was a terrible drought and a famine. And we find that in Ruth chapter 1. But, but worst of all, there was, there was no king. No, 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 no one was in charge. The book of Judges concludes with these tragic words. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We've lived through a time a bit like that as a nation. A leader who left behind him a trail of chaos where, where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And they looted and they pillaged and they stole because there was no king on the throne. And in the middle of this desolation, in the middle of this misery and, and chaos, we meet a heart sore and despairing woman named Hannah. Come with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1, and verses 1 and 2. It says this, it says, There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophon, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuph and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Hannah is caught in a polygamous and competitive marriage, and we're told only one thing about her. It's this. She was barren. The other wife in the relationship, Penina, has children, but Hannah has none. There's something about barrenness and childlessness. It's an aching heart sore. It's, it's quite common in the, in the Bible narrative and, and, of course, surprisingly common in our own world. In the Bible, there's, there's Sarah, there's Rebecca, there's Rachel, there's Manoah's wife, the mother of Samson. We're not even told her name. 
uh, she is barren, there's Elizabeth, and, and, and today we meet Hannah, childless. At least Hannah is married to a kind man. Elkanah was a was a believer in Yahweh, and so and so each year this this little family would would make the journey to a place called Shiloh. Shiloh was the 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 place where the tabernacle had had ended up after the conquest of the land under Joshua, and the ark was there, and the priests were there, and 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 a tab of the tent was there, and uh, some more permanent structures, and so each year this little family would come down from their log cabin, cabin somewhere up in the hill country to worship Yahweh. It, it wasn't a long journey, but it but it was a painful journey for Hannah. Uh, a significant part of, of Old Testament worship was a, was a family sacrifice. And so what you would do is you would come along and you'd bring an animal to offer to God. And some of it would get uh, burned up as a sin offering. Some you'd give to the priests as your contribution to their upkeep. And uh, that was a sort of a tithe. And, and some of it you'd eat yourselves. It, it, it was a, a celebration of God's provision. It was a, a celebration of thankfulness. It, it was a solemn time, but it was also a time of, of joy and gratitude to God for his enormous provision for you as a family in the last year. A time when you would remember how much he's blessed you. And so year by the year, this little family would go down and, and this would happen. And, and, and as it happened, Elkanah would dish out the meat at the sacrifice. Panina, my wife, here, here's the meat for you. And, and here's the meat for our eldest. And, and here's the meat for our daughter. And, and here's the meat for our second daughter. And, and here's the meat for our second son. Hannah, here's the meat for you. And, and each year when it happened, Panina would, would, would scoff at Hannah. <laughs> she'd, she, she'd provoke her and, and tease her and, and taunt her and, and, and make jibed remarks. Uh, eating alone tonight, Hannah? Uh, it's just you again for supper? Uh, we'll be over there, me and my family, our children, we'll be over there laughing, our big happy family. The text tells us in 1 Samuel 1 verse 5 that Elkanah gave to Hannah a, a, a double portion. The, the scholars say that the Hebrew is quite difficult to translate at this point. It's literally, if you'll find it funny, two noses as one portion. Now we're not sure whatever that means, but whatever it actually means, you, you have to visualize Hannah year after year eating her meat alone while the rest of the family celebrate together. Until on one night, she just couldn't bear it any longer. And so Hannah goes up to the tabernacle, goes up to the place where the ark is and to pray. She, she leaves the party behind and she makes her way into the enclosure of the house of God and she, she prays. In moments like that, we might get down on our knees, but, but Jews stand to pray. And so Hannah stands and she prays and she weeps. And, and as we often do in the, in those sorts of circumstances, she, she makes a vow to God. Chapter one, verse 11 says, Oh Yahweh, the God of hosts, the God of armies and power. If only you'll see me and, and remember me and give me a son, I'll give him to you all the days of his life. Eli, the priest, is, happens to be on duty. He's, he's like the church council member on duty, bustling around, checking that everyone's behaving, that everyone's got a seat, that everyone's uh, happy, that the fans are working and the lights are on. And, and, and he sees this woman and he, and he thinks she must be drunk. He, he thinks she's had too much wine as, as she's wobbling and babbling and, and praying. And, 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 and he does what I do when people come to church drunk. It happens quite often in our, in our evening service. Uh, homeless folk, they pitch up and they come to church and they, and they often reeking of booze. And they, and they then say to me, Pastor, I'm hungry. Uh, at which point I, I, I get ready to give them a lecture and tell, the reason, tell them the reason that you're hungry is that you spent your money on booze. And so visualize Eli, he's, he's just about to launch into his, uh, his stop drinking lecture. When Hannah tells him that she's, she's been praying out of her great anxiety. 
and her anguish. Verse 15 says, Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I'm a, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a, as a worthless woman. For all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you've made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favour in your eyes. Then the woman went on her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Well, as always, God hears, and God answers her prayer. Now, I must confess that one of my favourite moments as a pastor is, is when you come to me and you tell me, Jeff, can I, can I tell you about a, a, a prayer that God has answered? And so often people come to me and they say to me like, like it's amazing and, and I should be, and I should be surprised. But the, but the truth is I'm not surprised when God answers prayers. And, 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 and you shouldn't be either because, because God is a God who answers prayers. And too many times to count it, have I seen my own prayers answered and, 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 and here he is answering Hannah's prayer. Verse 19 says they, they rose early in the morning and, and worshipped before the Lord. And then they went back, this little family went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son and she called his name Samuel for she said, I've asked for him from the Lord. Now, what does it all mean? Is it a, a, a sweet story of how to act if, you, if you're childless and, 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 and really want a baby? Is, is this a story to, to teach us how we should pray in, in order to get God to, to, to answer our prayers? Is it a story that's, that's warning us of the dangers of polygamy? Is it a story that tells us that we that we shouldn't baptize our children but should rather dedicate our children? It's often used in, in that sort of context. What what does the story all mean? What's it about? Well, well to answer that question, let's read on to, to scene two. Let's read on to, to chapter two, where we see and find Hannah again at prayer. For a few years, Hannah and baby Samuel don't go up to Shiloh. He's born, she nurses him, she cares for him until he's weaned. Maybe she, she keeps him on the breast just, a, just a, a, a little bit longer to have him for a little while. But, but there's, no, there's no sense or indication of that in the text. There's only Hannah's faithfulness. And when Samuel is weaned, she goes up to Silo with her beloved son. She takes him to Eli. Verse 24 says, And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. And then they slaughtered the bull. And they brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I've lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. Hannah hands her son to Eli, and as she does that, she prays. Look at chapter 2 with me. Look at verses 1 to 10 with me. Hannah prayed, and she said, 
My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There's none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken. But the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. But those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honour. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones. But the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed one. Now what might you have prayed? If you were a mother that was handing over your much longed for precious young toddler into the care of a of a priest of a religious professional, this baby that you've you've desired so much that you that you're now giving away, what, what might you have prayed? You, perhaps you might have prayed, oh, oh Lord, care for him, please. May he be well parented, may he may he grow up to be a success and may he may he fulfil his potential. Oh Lord, may he be loved. Perhaps you might have prayed some of those things. Well, Hannah prays none of those things. Startlingly, she prays about God. She remembers, verse 1, that God is a God of salvation. She remembers, verse 2, that God is holy, that God is unique, that God knows, verse 3, and God judges, and that God is a God of mid-story reversals. She remembers, verse 4, that he, he breaks the mighty and he binds the feeble. Verse 5, he empties the full and fills the empty. He, he makes the barren fruitful and those with many children he makes forlorn. He kills and he brings to life. Verse 6, he makes the rich poor and the poor he raises up to sit in, in seats of honour. Verse 7 and verse 8, he will, he will guard his people and he will cut off the wicked. And his kingdom will not overcome by power, nor by might. It's an extraordinary prayer. It, it's, it's, it's even a, a, a revolutionary prayer. It teaches us about our God and the way that he works. Here's the shocking truth that you must grasp about God. God's plan is not to make you rich. God's plan is not to make you happy. God's plan is not to make you successful or famous or beautiful. God's plan is not to give us self-actualization or, or to give us health and wealth. God's plan is actually shockingly a reversal of those things. God's plan is to raise up a king in a world where there is no king. 
God's plan is to raise up a judge to make things right. God's plan is to destroy his enemies and to save his people. God's plan is to humble the rich and to remove the powerful. God's plan is to raise up the downtrodden and to, and to strengthen the weak and to, and to provide for the poor. And God will work his plan through his king. Uh, chapter 2 verse 10 says, The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed, his anointed one. Now that's, that's dynamite in a world where, where everyone does as, as they see fit because there is no king. Here is one of the first hints that God will fix the human story through a king. Now could Samuel, this baby that's just been born, could he be that king? Could, could this baby born to a barren woman be the fulfillment of his mother's prayers and, and the fulfillment of God's amazing plans? Could, could this be the way in which God is going to reverse the trajectory of human, of human history, reverse the, the human story? No, they're going to have to wait for that just a little bit longer, uh, uh, another thousand years actually. The nation of Israel, they're going to have to wait for another child to be born. When the God of reversals brings about his great reversal through the birth of the king. This king will not be born in a palace. He won't be born in a, he'll be born in a stable. He won't be born to the elite and the intellectuals, but to a rural teenage single girl. He'll not go to the best school or university. He'll, he'll not live in the place where everybody wants to live. He'll live in, in Nazareth. And he'll be weak and he'll be a preacher. And then they'll kill him on a cross and his, his friends will scatter and the world will laugh and the world will scoff. And, and then he'll rise again and ascend to heaven and, and leave behind a, a small bunch of frightened semi-literate men. And that weak and pathetic and seemingly insignificant event will be the great reversal for all humanity. That weak and pathetic and seemingly insignificant be event will be the moment when God takes the human story of lawlessness and rebellion and dysfunction and pain and brokenness and, and he reverses it. When that child is born, God reverses the trajectory of our world. He saves us. When that child is born, God reverses the trajectory and makes it possible that our story might be happily ever after. Samuel's not that king. Samuel's a shadow, a hint, a foretaste, an hors d'oeuvre, a promise that God's great reversal is coming. And so again I ask, what does it all mean? It, it means confidence in a world of pain, confidence in a world of disease and death. God has got a plan, and, and there is a king on the throne. It, it means celebration and joy in the midst of a life where things just aren't as we desire them to be. What does it all mean? It means that now we can live with joy in the middle of pain. Because there is a God who's reversing things. It means celebration because, because each one of us can be saved and redeemed and delivered. It means hope of, of, of something more, something better. What does it all mean? It means fear and humility. When we contemplate our wealth and our status and our education and our place in this world. 
And we ask ourselves, could we be the rich that God is going to bring down? Could we be the mighty that God will break? Could we be the fool that he will make empty? Could we be the ones reversed? God's purposes are a reversal of all we hold dear. We would fill the kingdom with superstars and the ultra-rich. He will fill his kingdom with the poor and the illiterate and the nobodies and anybody who wants to come. We'd fill the kingdom with Nobel Prize winners and the learned. But he fills his kingdom with the illiterate and the humble and the poor. And so, as the West in its sophistication and education and wealth has rejected God, God has gone where he's welcomed to other nations who've embraced him. There's a great warning for us here. Let's be careful lest we think our money and our education and our literacy and our status in society make us think that God is pleased with us. God is pleased with us when we bow the knee to his king. And in humility we enter his kingdom by his grace. Not with hands and hearts full of boasts. But with hearts desperate and humbled and broken. And so we celebrate and we tremble. Looking to the the God of reversals. Knowing that the midpoint reversal in all of history has happened. He's raised up a king. And soon the story will finally end when that king returns. Come, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you're a God who has reversed the trajectory of human history. You've taken the brokenness and our rejection And you have given us a king. You have sent your son into the world. That our story might not be ultimately a story of tragedy. But a story of salvation. And a story of blessing. We thank you, Father, that you are a God of midpoint reversals. Thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Spoke the earth to life and formed the skies above to him. The glory all began.